Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and happy Monday. I hope everyone is doing well, staying safe. Uh, Mr. Claspa here, I had the thought of uh, to help you guys in reviewing and getting ready uh, for the AP exam since we're not able to meet to um, video, uh, do a video recording of me going through my slides for the different topics that we've covered and kind of just explaining, talking. Um, and so I think I'll be doing that for each unit, uploading that periodically, probably upload some videos where maybe I go through some practice problems or something like that to help you guys get a good feel for that. Uh, before I launch into this, just a couple announcements. Don't forget, um, AP exams have been adjusted. And so uh, as of right now, the plan is that the exam will be administered online, a 45 minute exam. And uh, they have uh, decided to only do topics one through seven. Um, that's everything we've covered so far. Uh, we were about to start topic 10 and then hit topic eight and nine, but we don't have to worry about it anymore. I'm excited about that. Um, keep in mind that uh, at nine o'clock every day, uh, at least during the week, weekdays, uh, nine o'clock college board does a live AP review session where they'll, they'll uh, go over different uh, uh, AP topics to help us get ready. I uploaded a link to our uh, Google Classroom so that you can find that playlist. Um, you can find all the other videos that have been recorded by them. It's really good. Um, I haven't watched them all yet, but I've watched some of them and I've learned some stuff. There's some ideas that other AP teachers have had. Um, that I've never noticed before, so I recommend it. It's gonna have some variety to what just what I present, which will help you guys out a little bit more. Maybe you'll learn some different tricks or techniques that make sense to you, and so you can use them. But um, that's every day at nine o'clock, and then if you miss it, that's okay. You can still go to that playlist uh, in YouTube. Um, I have, again, I have the link in Google Classroom, and you can go ahead and watch it there anytime you want. So far, it looks like they've been spending a lot of time on rotational physics, torque, um, rotational kinematics, stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> also, I've opened up some assignments in AP Classroom um, to help you get some more practice, more review uh, for kinematics. So the two assignments that I've uploaded that you can look for is called, the first one's entitled Kinematics Check, and the second one is entitled Unit One Progress Check, FRQ. That one's got a couple of uh, free response questions to, to try out. So um, anyhow, as always, if you have any questions, let me know. Um, email me, uh, make a comment in Google Classroom. Uh, just something I'll, I'll get back to. I'll help you out as best I can. So let me go ahead and share my screen here and I'll go ahead and get started going through the slides. <clears throat> There we go. Hopefully you can see that. All right. So, oops. So the idea of uh, this first unit, kinematics. Kinematics uh, means motion. So anytime we're talking about kinematics, we're going to be looking at the motion of an object. It's one of the most basic fundamental uh, ways for us to start looking at uh, physics and how objects are behaving due to the different forces, varieties, stuff like that. So uh, first off, one thing to look at is that position is um, the first main concept that we want to understand. Generally speaking, so the position of an object is just where it's physically located. Um, we get to pick what we call our origin or zero position. Um, Sometimes in a problem, it might be defined for you, um, but often we can define it to be wherever the heck we want. So here in this example, we've got four different people. And if I were to ask you, what is their position? We would first have to identify what is the origin? What is position zero? And right here, we can see this one is zero meters. We always tell position in meters. This person right here is located, beautiful, glasses, bow tie. That looks great. Anyhow, he is at position zero. He is zero meters away from the origin. This person right here, we would say that he is at the negative one meter position. This gentleman right here is at the positive two meter position. And this gentleman right here is at the positive four meter position. Now, this scale was set 
But if it hadn't been set force, we could have arbitrarily chosen where we wanted our zero position to be. We could have said that this gentleman right here was at the zero position. And if that's the case, then this gentleman right here would have been one, two meters away from zero position. So his position would have been positive two meters. And if this was our zero position right here, this person over here and this person over would be at negative one, two, this person would be at negative two meters, and then one more for negative three meters with this position right here. Um, this is one of the first things that you want to identify in problems. Do I have an origin? Do I have a zero position? What is it? Because that's going to help define uh, some of the other uh, concepts that we're going to talk about. So general definitions, displacement. Displacement is a change in the position of an object. It's a vector. Vectors, uh, velocity, displacement, acceleration, all of these are going to be vectors. So displacement simply tells me how did the position change. Um, whether you're in the positive or negative position doesn't really affect displacement so much, just as far as what was the change. Velocity is the rate that the position changes at, so it's displacement over time. And acceleration is the rate at which the velocity changes. So it's a change in velocity over time. If we go to the next slide, you can see this. Commonly, we'll use this triangle. That, that is a delta. It represents a change in something. So since x can sometimes be a position, we would read delta x as a change in position. Since x refers to the x position often, we can say that this perhaps would be a change in our x position. Now, because a change is simply a final minus initial, we can take our delta x, our change in the x position, and we can rewrite it as x final minus x initial, all right? We can do the same thing with velocity. Velocity is our displacement over time. Displacement is a change in position. So we have our final position minus our initial position all divided by time. Same thing for acceleration. Acceleration is a change in velocity over time. So we can say it's our final velocity minus our initial velocity divided by time. Units, let's talk units. Units are important. Displacement always has the units of meters. Sometimes you might see centimeters, millimeters, kilometers. Those are all can refer to displacement, but the general terms that we want to um, default to is just plain meters. Velocity, we're looking for meters per second. Acceleration would be meters per second per second or meters per second squared. All right. So something to keep in mind. Whenever we talk about positive displacement, positive velocity, positive acceleration, all that tells me is that it's moving in the positive direction. It doesn't tell me that the object is located in the positive or negative side. That's going to be position that tells us that. But displacement, velocity, acceleration, positive displacement, velocity, acceleration simply tells me that the object's change in position is in the positive direction or the object's change in uh, the rate at which the object's position changes is in the positive direction, or that the object is accelerating in the positive direction. Okay, negative displacement means the object's changing its position in the negative direction. Negative velocity means it's moving in the negative direction. Negative acceleration means it's accelerating in the negative direction, okay? Um, just uh, as a reminder, we tend to refer to the right and up as positive direction. So right would be the positive x direction and up would be the positive y direction. Negative direction. Left would be our negative x direction and down would be our negative y direction. So just keep that in mind. And it's possible to have positive displacement on the negative, in a negative position or positive velocity in a negative position or positive acceleration in a negative position and vice versa. So you just got to watch out for that. So how do we know if an object is speeding up or slowing down? In order to figure this one out, you're going to have to compare the acceleration to the velocity. So if the velocity is in the same direction as the acceleration, we will say the object is speeding up. Doesn't matter if it's positive or negative. If they're in the same direction, object speeding up. So right here, we have our velocity to going to the right positive direction, positive x direction. Right here, we have our acceleration to the right, so positive x direction, because they're both going in the same direction. An object that experiences this 
would be speeding up. Its velocity would increase. And then if we look over here, we have velocity in the negative direction. It's moving to the left. All right, we have this acceleration in the negative direction. It's moving to the left. They are both still in the same direction, both going left. So this object would also be speeding up. Its velocity would increase. So situation one, our velocity will increase going in the positive direction. Over here, our velocity would increase in the negative direction. All right. So how do we know if it's slowing down? Well, opposite is what we're looking for. So velocity and acceleration are going in opposite directions. So situation one right here, velocity is going to the right, positive x direction. Acceleration is going to the left, negative x direction. They're in opposite directions. So the velocity is still going to the right, but it will slow down. It will decrease in size. It will get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until eventually it gets to zero. Situation two, velocity is going to the left in the negative uh, x direction, and acceleration is going to the right, positive x direction. They are still in opposite directions. So again, the object would be slowing down. Velocity would still be in the negative x direction. It would still be to the, to the left. However, it would be getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and closer and closer until eventually it gets to zero, and it's not moving anymore. So keep that in mind. That's what we want to look for. Same direction, speeding up. Opposite direction, slowing down. All right, now we're gonna move on to motion time graphs. I remember every single one of you love motion time graphs. Hopefully this will be a good review, help you remember some of the stuff. Maybe you'll get some more insight to this. So the, the idea of a motion time graph is it's just gonna be able to help us analyze the motion of an object at, throughout time. Um, typically we're looking at displacement, velocity, or acceleration. So displacement time graphs, velocity time graphs or acceleration time graphs. Now, each graph is its own graph. It's separate from the other ones, they're distinct. Um, however, they do connect and relate to each other. So whenever you're looking at a motion time graph, the first thing you wanna do is look at the axes to decide what type of graph am I looking at? Am I looking at a displacement time graph? Am I looking at a velocity time graph? Or am I looking at an acceleration time graph? That's the first thing you wanna do. All right, first thing you wanna do. Um, the information, when we look at the graphs the, uh, of these motion time graphs throughout time, we can pull information from each graph to learn uh, information that might be able to help us set up a different one. So we might be able to look at a velocity time graph and pull information from it that could help us set up an acceleration time graph. Or we could pull information to help us set up a, a position or displacement time graph. Um, you got, and we're gonna go over how to pull some information from them. So let's take a look. First, we're gonna start with a displacement time graph. First things, let's look at our axes. Our y-axis right here has been labeled displacement with meters. And then our x-axis, our horizontal axis, is labeled as time in seconds. So this is a displacement time graph. That's how I know what type of graph it is. So um, the position of the object can be positive or negative. That just tells me where is it located relative to the origin. So right here we can see that this object starts at the origin and then it's still in the negative position after three seconds. And then after another, by the time it gets to five seconds, it's switched over to a positive position. So if we were using our traditional left, right, meaning positive, negative, we would say that this object was on the left of the origin for the first three seconds. And then after that, it's still on the left of the origin because it still has negative position right up until right here. Once it passes just after four seconds, it's now in the positive position. It's to the right of the origin. And even after seven seconds, it's still in the right of the origin, it's still in the positive position. And so we would say that it's going to continue down here in the positive position, all right? So let's try to see what information we can pull from this. So if we look at five seconds, t equals five seconds until t equals seven seconds, how does the position of the object change? So we go to five seconds and we look all the way until seven seconds. What do you notice? 
Well, the position stays at four meters. It doesn't change its position at all. So we would say that the object from five seconds to seven seconds is stationary. It is not moving. Okay, now let's look at three seconds until five seconds. How does the position of the object change from three seconds to five seconds? Three seconds to five seconds. Well, some information we can gather from this is one, the slope is going up. It's going up and up and up and up and up. So this tells me that the object is perhaps moving to the right, but you notice from three seconds until just after four seconds, it is still in a negative position. And after that point, it becomes in a positive position. All right, so from t equals three seconds to five seconds, it moves from a negative position all the way up to a positive position. All right, now here's my question. What do you think the slope could represent? All right, the slope is telling us something right here. We can see that the position, the slope tells us that the position changes from negative all the way up to positive. So what would that slope represent? Well, on a displacement time graph, a position time graph, the slope is gonna tell us about the velocity. We'll talk more about that in just a minute. So um, here is a graph that has some additional information, okay? Um, about what different lines on a uh, position time graph, distance time graph could look like. So um, as we already talked about, a flat line means that it's stationary, object's not moving, it's stopped, okay? A linear line, constant linear line, means that it is, has a steady or constant velocity. Even right here, still constant velocity, just this one's a positive constant velocity, this one's a negative constant velocity. Curved lines on a position time graph tell us that the object is getting faster and faster and faster. It is accelerating, all right? Now, if this curve happens to be quadratic, that would tell us that it is a constant acceleration. I doubt you're gonna get tested on that very much, but that's just for your information. Now, keep in mind this graph right here only shows you the positive position. Negative position works as well. You just got to pay attention to what that, uh, what that uh, could mean. So I want you to consider what the different shapes would mean if the graph was showing negative displacement. Okay, so we can use information in a displacement time graph to learn about velocity. The slope on a displacement time graph tells us that the velocity of an object, uh, what the velocity of an object is throughout time. So if, let's take a look at some of these examples. Each one pairs up like this, and then this pairs up, and then this pairs up. So let's look at these two right here. So first we have a position time graph. What do we notice about the position as it goes throughout time on this graph? It's flat, so what does flat mean? Flat means that it's not changing its position. It's stationary, it's not moving. The slope is constant, the slope here doesn't change, and it's zero, the slope is always zero on this graph. So if we were to look at a velocity time graph, that would mean we want a constant number, not a constant slope here on this graph, a constant number, and we want that number to be zero. So if we look, the number never changes, so that tells me the slope on the position time graph will never change, but in this case, the velocity is also zero constantly, which means that I would expect a flat line on this. So these two match up very well. Let's look at this one. What do we notice about the position throughout time on this graph? Well, the position is changing. It's not stationary. However, the slope is still constant. So the position changes, but the slope is constant. And is the slope positive or negative? The slope is positive. So I would expect on a velocity time graph, I would expect to see a constant velocity, a constant positive velocity. So let's look. Over here, we have a constant velocity and that velocity is positive. So this matches up very nicely with our position time graph. All right, let's look at this one. Here we have a curved line. So the object is changing position, but it's not changing at the same rate. We, would ex we see that the slope is constantly getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So it's speeding up. So what we would see 
because it's getting larger and larger in the positive direction, we should see a velocity that's increasing. All right, it's increasing. And if this is quadratic, we would say it's increasing at a constant rate. All right, so let's look over here. We have positive velocity, which is what we wanted to see here. And that velocity is increasing because it's increasing at a positive rate. That tells us that this is a constant acceleration right here. Okay, so these are just some examples of how all of these different graphs relate to each other and how we can use information from one to help us construct some basics in the other one. So let's go back to slope. Normally when you're calculating slope, it's gonna be rise over run, all right? Normally when we're calculating slope, it's gonna be rise over run. Um, the change in the vertical divided by the change in the horizontal, all right? So normally we do that with the numbers. However, to help us understand how we know that slope represents velocity, why it represents velocity, we're gonna look at the units. So the units for our vertical or our rise are meters. So that means all the units in our numerator are going to be meters, all right? So rise is gonna be over the run, it's gonna be over the horizontal. So what are the units for my horizontal? The units are seconds. So the denominator will have units of seconds. So I have meters in my numerator, seconds in my denominator, meters divided by seconds, all right? Well, I know what meters per second are. Meters per second are the units for velocity. Therefore, the slope on this graph represents the velocity. By doing this little unit analysis, we can figure out what the slope represents. It's a pretty useful uh, tool to be able to do this, all right? So let's practice determining velocity and slope, okay? I want you to go ahead and calculate the velocity from zero to three seconds. Then I want you to calculate the velocity from three seconds to five seconds. And then I want you to calculate the velocity from five seconds to seven seconds. And then finally from seven seconds to eight seconds. Um, go ahead, let's go ahead and just pause the video. Uh, I'm not gonna pause it, I'll just be quiet just for a little bit, but if you need some time, you can go ahead and pause the video to do those calculations real quick. Um, so go ahead, let's take some time to do that. So let's take a look at each one. Let's look at first t equals zero seconds all the way to t equals three seconds. So let's look at our rise over run. It's our change in our y divided by the change in our x, so to speak, okay? So let's look at our final y position. That's gonna be negative six. Our initial y position is zero. So negative six minus zero equals negative six, so your rise in this case will be negative six. Let's look at the run. We finish at three seconds. We started at zero seconds. So three minus zero equals three seconds. All right, so our run or our denominator would be positive three seconds. So our slope from zero to three is going to be negative six meters divided by three seconds. So we would say it's negative two meters per second. All right, hopefully that helps. I'm not gonna tell you right now the other slopes. You calculate it, see what you can do. Um, I have these slides uploaded to Google Classroom. If you go and you look at them, um, don't do the presentation mode. Um, you can actually click on something called notes right here. And it, I actually have listed the different values. So actually, I'm going to tell you right now. I didn't realize I could do that right now. Hopefully, you can see this. If not, go back to the slides. But here are the different values for the different time frames right there. All right? So check your work. See if you got the right answers. All right, moving on. So a velocity time graph. Let's go to velocity time graph. 
it shows the velocity throughout time. It does not tell us, just to be clear, a velocity time graph does not tell us whether the position of the object is positive or negative. In order to know that, we have to look at a displacement time graph. A displacement time graph tells us whether the position of the object is positive or negative. Velocity time graph does not tell us that information at all, okay? So if we wanna know if it's a velocity time graph, we're gonna look at the axes. Our vertical axis, our y-axis is velocity, meters per second. Our horizontal or y, x-axis, excuse me, is time, which is in seconds, all right? Positive velocity simply means, so positive velocity means it's above the horizontal axis. That means it's moving in the positive direction. All right, that means that our velocity is in the positive direction. Negative or below the horizontal axis, that tells us that the object is moving in the negative direction. <clears throat> so let's practice obtaining information. Look at the vo object's velocity from zero seconds to four seconds. Describe the object's velocity from zero seconds to four seconds. <clears throat> well, you'll notice the velocity is Keep in mind, each one of these squares is two. So positive two, four, six, eight, 10, negative two, four, six, eight, negative 10. So the object's velocity starts at negative 12 and stays constant until negative 12. So we would say it has a constant negative velocity of 12, negative 12 meters per second from zero to four seconds, okay? Now, describe the object's velocity from four seconds all the way until it gets to nine seconds. So I guess to be clear, it's only two in the vertical. If we look at the horizontal, it's just one second, two seconds, three seconds, four seconds, five seconds. So from four seconds all the way up to nine seconds, describe the object's velocity. Well, the object's velocity starts at negative 12 and it changes. It starts to slow down. How do I know it's slowing down? I know it's slowing down because it's getting closer and closer to zero. When we're looking at a velocity time graph, if your velocity is getting closer and closer to zero, it's slowing down, okay? So from four seconds to six seconds, the object is slowing down. It's still negative, but it's getting slower and slower and slower until at six seconds, it stopped moving, all right? Um, from six seconds all the way to nine seconds, it's positive velocity and it gets further and further away from zero, which means that it is speeding up in the positive direction all the way until nine seconds, okay? Constant slope, which tells us something. We're gonna talk about that in just a sec. So I wanna pause real quick and just say, hey, look over here. Notice that this is positive velocity, but the positive velocity starting here at 13 seconds it gets closer and closer and closer to zero, which tells me that it is going in the positive direction, but slowing down, okay? So what do you think the slope, we've pointed out a constant slope here, constant positive slope here, constant negative slope here. What do you think the slope on a velocity time graph represents? Well, the slope on a velocity time graph represents acceleration, all right? So we'll talk about that in just a minute. So once again, we have a similar graphic, a velocity time graph, all right? Con a constant flat line means a constant velocity, constant speed, okay? A linear line, constant slope, linear line means acceleration. Positive means positive acceleration, negative means negative acceleration. In this graph, they call it deceleration. I don't like that. Um, my experience is most of the time it just would say negative acceleration. Um, so just keep that in mind. Uh, because this is a curve, that tells us that the velocity is changing. However, the acceleration is also changing as well. So once again, this is just a positive, this is just a positive um, velocity. If you want to, I want you to think about what these different shapes could mean if we were in the negative velocity. Um, so just think about that, see what you can come up with. And now that I know this, I can click notes and I have a description of what those different things 
could mean. Hopefully you had some similar thoughts and ideas. All right, moving on. Same thing here. We can pull information from a velocity time graph to learn about acceleration. We've got some examples here. They match up just the same as they did before. So we have a flat line right here that is zero, okay? So the velocity here is zero. The velocity here is zero, and it never changes, okay? So we have a constant slope of zero. And since slope in a velocity time graph is acceleration, that means that my acceleration should be zero and constantly zero. So if I look at my acceleration time graph, acceleration time graph, my acceleration is zero and it's constantly zero, it never changes. Let's come down here. Velocity is not zero anymore, but it's still a constant velocity. It never changes. So the slope is still zero and the slope of zero never changes. So if I look at an acceleration time graph, I will get the same exact acceleration time graph. Zero acceleration matches our zero slope over here, and then it's a constant zero. This slope is constant, it never changes, so these match up as well, all right? Now let's look at a velocity time graph where the velocity is changing. We have a constant change, so the slope stays the same throughout this. Constant slope, and in this case, it is a positive slope. So if I'm looking at an acceleration time graph, I want a constant acceleration, that is positive. Well, this acceleration is constant, it doesn't change, and in this case, it's positive. So this matches quite nicely, all right? What do you think an acceleration time graph would look like if the velocity time graph line was curved instead? Well, how would that look over here? Think about that, see what you can come up with. All right, how do we know that slope of a velocity time graph is acceleration? Well, we're gonna do the same thing we did for the displacement time graph. We're gonna compare units. Our rise is velocity, so it's gonna be meters per second. Our run, our seconds, so that's gonna be, our, our, our run is time, so it's gonna be seconds, all right? So we have meters per second over seconds. Velocity over time, meters per second over seconds. That's gonna be meters per second per second or meters per second squared, those are the units for acceleration. That's how I know that the slope on a velocity time graph equals acceleration because the units match, all right? So let's practice. Pause if you need to, I'll pause for a little bit, but if you need more time, that's fine, just pause the video. Um, let's practice determining acceleration from a velocity time graph, all right? Once again, four different sections. I want you to go from zero to four seconds, tell me what the acceleration is. Then from four seconds all the way up to nine seconds, what's the acceleration? Then from nine seconds to 13 seconds, what's the acceleration? And then from 13 seconds to 18 seconds, what's the acceleration? So pause if you need to, take a little time, see what you can figure out. Okay. Well, I'll just tell you right now, the first one's real easy. What's the slope right here? Well, there's no change in my rise. I go from negative 12 to negative 12. So my slope would be zero, which means that my acceleration here is zero. All right. So this is easy, which means that nine seconds to 13 seconds is going to be easy as well because we have the same slope right here. It is zero. So the acceleration right here and the acceleration up here, zero meters per second per second, all right? So let's look at this one, all right? We finish at 18 meters per second in my rise, and then we started in the rise at negative 12 meters per second. So 18 meters per second minus negative 12 meters per second should give you 30 meters per second. Now let's look at the change in the run, the change in time. We go from nine seconds, or we finish at nine seconds. We started at four seconds, so nine minus four is five. So we have 30 meters per second over, or divided by, five seconds. 
So the slope here would be six meters per second per second, or six meters per second squared. Okay, hopefully you were able to calculate what this last one would be. Take a look right here. Boom. Look at that. Amazing. All right, hopefully that makes sense. Okay, an acceleration time graph will show us the acceleration of an object throughout time. So let's talk about this. It doesn't tell us whether the, po the velocity or the position is positive or negative. It doesn't tell us any of that. It just helps us understand the velocity throughout, or excuse me, the acceleration throughout time, okay? Positive acceleration above the horizontal simply means it's accelerating in the positive direction. Negative acceleration below the horizontal simply tells us it's accelerating in the negative direction, all right? So let's practice obtaining information. Describe the acceleration from zero to three seconds, then describe the acceleration from three seconds to nine seconds. Okay, notice acceleration is constant, doesn't change. So it has a constant acceleration, a constant positive acceleration of, in this case, four meters per second squared, all right? From three seconds to nine seconds, the acceleration is decreasing. The acceleration gets closer and closer and closer to zero. It's still positive. We still have positive acceleration because it's above the horizontal, but it's getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So acceleration is decreasing until it gets to zero at seven seconds. Then after seven seconds, we have negative acceleration that is getting larger. It gets further and further away from zero. So our acceleration is getting bigger after seven seconds in the negative direction, all right? The slope of an acceleration time graph is called jerk. You're not gonna be tested on jerk. You don't need to know that, all right? So I guess I don't know why I told you that, but there you go. Okay, slope won't help us if we have an acceleration time graph. However, looking at the slope of, that says slope of an object, wow. Slope of, let me, that should say slope of, a motion. Whoa. Well, this is embarrassing, but I do this in class all the time as well. Beautiful. Look at that. That's fantastic. Looks better. I hope. There we go. Okay, so looking at the slope of a motion time graph is not the only way to obtain information, all right? We can also look at the area between the line and the axis. We sometimes will call this the area under the curve. Even if the line is not curved, that's okay. We still sometimes will call it the area under the curve. For most graphs, the shapes between the line and the axis, the area under the curve, aren't gonna be simple shapes, all right? So what we're gonna to have to do is divide those weird shapes into shapes that we know. So we start, whoops, we started right here, okay? This is an easy shape, this red one right here, because that's a triangle. However, this shape right here, I don't, I don't know how to calculate that area. I know the area of a triangle, but I don't know how to calculate that area. So we'll split it up, all right? The colors might be a little hard to see, I apologize for that. But from zero to three seconds, we can split this up into a blue rectangle. Well, I can calculate the area of a rectangle, so that's easy. Then I go from three seconds to seven seconds, that's just a green triangle. Well, I can calculate the area of a green triangle, and then we have our red triangle right here. I can calculate that area. So by breaking it down into shapes that I know, I can combine all of those to calculate the total area. Calculate each one of these small areas individually and then combine them all together, all right? So this is a good example. The area of a rectangle is base times height, length times width, however you wanna call it, all right? So we have four meters per second multiplied by three seconds. That gives us an area of 12 meters per second for number one, the blue rectangle. Area of a triangle is one half base times height. 
well, the height is still four meters per second. The base is still, is in this case, four seconds. Three to seven is four seconds. So that's going to give us an area here of eight meters per second. Four times four is 16. Multiplied by one half is eight. All right. So area three. So right now I have an area of 12 meters per second, an area of eight meters per second. And then over here, area of a triangle, one half times the height, which is negative two meters per second, you need to include the negative, and then a time of two seconds. So two seconds times negative two meters per second squared is negative four seconds. Negative four seconds multiplied by one half, excuse me, negative four meters per second square, uh, give, ugh, goodness, negative two, meters per second squared multiplied by two seconds gives us negative four meters per second multiplied by one half, which gives us negative two meters per second. So to calculate the total area, I'm gonna combine negative 12, eight, excuse me, that's not negative 12. I'm gonna combine 12 meters per second, eight meters per second, and negative two meters per second, all right? That gives us a total area of 18 meters per second. All right, so the total area under this curve would be 18 meters per second. Well, what do you think that, air, that information represents? I calculated the area under the curve. We calculated the area under the curve on this acceleration time graph, but what information does that tell us? Well, look at the units. What were the units of the total area? Meters per second. So I'm guessing that the total or the information that I get from the area under the curve has something to do with velocity. And that would be correct, all right? Meters per second, oh, I jumped the gun, whoops. Yep. The area under the curve on an acceleration time graph represents the total change in the object's velocity, all right? Please keep in mind, it does not represent the actual velocity. So the actual velocity of this object is not necessarily going to be 18 meters per second. All this tells me is that it has changed by 18 meters per second. So if my velocity started at, I don't know, 100 meters per second, by calculating the area under the curve, I know that I would end, I would change that 100 meters per second by another 18 meters per second. So the final velocity of the object would be 118 meters per second. Hopefully that makes sense to you, okay? We're gonna practice, all right? Um, let's look at a velocity time graph. Well, I guess we'll get to practice later. So let's uh, consider a velocity time graph. I know it's a velocity time graph because I can look at my axes. What are the units for the vertical axis? Units for the vertical axis? That would be meters per second. What are the units for the horizontal axis? Horizontal axis would be seconds. So to calculate area, we normally are going to end up in some fashion multiplying the axis together. All right. The exact formula will depend, but usually we're multiplying the two axes together to get area. So if we take meters per second, multiply it by seconds, think about the units that gives us, and what do you think the area underneath the curve here on this type of graph would represent? Well, meters per second multiplied by seconds gives us meters. So if you said that the area under the curve represents the total change in position of the object, you'd be correct. It doesn't represent the actual position, just the change. Just like the area underneath an acceleration uh, time graph curve, it doesn't represent the actual velocity, just the total change in the velocity. Well, over here, the area under the curve doesn't represent the actual position, just the total change in the position of the object. So I want you to practice. Take a little time. What is the total displacement or change in position of the object for this velocity time graph? You're gonna have to divide this into several different areas, at least one, two, three, four, five areas, add them all together, that's gonna represent your total change in position. So go ahead, I'll pause for a little bit. You guys pause the video if you need more time. See what you can come up with.
my guess is that most of you will need to pause the video to do that. That's fine. I'm getting impatient, so I'm going to keep talking. Um, five different areas, smaller areas to calculate. We can get a rectangle from zero to four seconds. We can get a triangle from four seconds to six seconds. We get another triangle from six seconds to nine seconds. We can get a rectangle from nine seconds to 13 seconds. And then we can get another, uh, sorry, a rectangle from nine seconds to 13 seconds. And then we can get another triangle from 13 seconds to 18 seconds, all right? So let me bring up the notes. Right here is a very good description. I break it down as far as each area's areas are numbered from left to right. Rectangle, triangle, triangle, rectangle, triangle. The areas of each one of those shapes, you add them all together, you should get 84 meters. Therefore, since the total area is 84 meters, that means that your total displacement would be positive 84 meters, okay? Now keep in mind, that's just a displacement. It's just a change in the position. It doesn't tell us the final position of the object, okay? If you started, I already forgot what it was, 83, I think, 84. So if I started at a position of negative 100, if I started at a position of negative 100 meters, well, I changed that by positive 84, so negative 100, plus 84 would give you a position, a final position of negative 16 meters, all right? So this doesn't inherently tell us the final position of an object. You're gonna to have to compare it to where the object started. And you might not know that, that's okay. You just have to look at the problem, see what the information gives you, and what is the problem asking you to do. All right, <clears throat> on a displacement time graph, the area under the curve has no significance. I will be very shocked and upset if they tested you on that because they shouldn't, it doesn't really have any significance for us, all right? Um, so just a quick view, what is displacement? What is displacement time graph? And what is the information of the slope of a displacement time graph give us? Well, displacement is a change in position. The units are meters. A displacement time graph shows me visually, graphically, how the displacement, or excuse me, how the position will change throughout time. And the slope of a displacement time graph will tell me the velocity throughout time. Okay, through that time frame. Velocity. Velocity is the, dis, the rate at which our position changes. It is displacement over time. A velocity, the units are meters per second. A velocity time graph, a velocity time graph will tell us how the velocity changes throughout time. By looking at the slope of a velocity time graph, we can figure out acceleration. And if we look at the area under the curve on a velocity time graph, that will tell us the total change in position or displacement. Acceleration is the rate at which our velocity changes. All right, it's a change in velocity divided by time. The units are meters per second per second or meters per second squared. Um, an acceleration time graph simply tells us how the acceleration changes throughout time. And the area underneath the curve on an acceleration time graph will tell us the total change in velocity. Not the actual final velocity, but what the total change in velocity will be during that time frame. All right. All right. That was a lot. But now that we've considered a graphical analysis of displacement, velocity, and acceleration, we're going to start looking at situations and problems that relate to. Um, these three things. We're going to start by defining what free fall is, okay? You may or may not have heard of free fall before. In physics, it has a very specific uh, definition. In order for an object to be considered in free fall, there needs to be no forces acting on it other than the force of gravity. So when we first started talking about that, we hadn't talked about forces, so what we said to look for was there's no other objects touching it and there's no air resistance. We've talked about forces now, so you should be able to use this first definition. It's more accurate, okay? An object is in free fall when there are no forces acting on it except for gravity. That includes air resistance. If air resistance is acting on an object, then we can't really say that it's in free fall, all right? We want no air resistance, no friction, nothing. Only gravity, only the force of gravity is acting on it. Then we can say the object is in free fall, all right? So, 
when an object is in free fall, it will only accelerate due to the force of gravity. If it's not in free fall, the actual acceleration of the object will be, it could be different. We would have to look at the situation, all right? So the acceleration due to gravity on Earth is 9.81 meters per second squared. We use a lowercase g to represent that, okay? Notice, lowercase g equals positive 9.81 meters per second squared. Ladies and gentlemen, round it to 10, okay? It's a very safe thing to do to round it to 10. And honestly, it's going to make your math a lot easier and faster if you just use 10. The only time you don't really want to use 10 is if, one, the problem tells you use 9.81, or if you're doing a lab, an actual lab, you're collecting data and you're doing calculations, then you want to be as precise as possible. Working problems on a test or something like that, honest, unless the problem tells you to use 9.81, round it to 10. If that doesn't get you the exact answer, it's gonna get you close enough to the answer that you'll know what the answer is, okay? When an object is in free fall, it will only experience acceleration in the y direction from gravity, okay? So our acceleration in the y direction, in this case, will be negative g, or negative 9.81 meters per second squared. This is the actual acceleration that would be experienced by an object in free fall, okay? The acceleration due to gravity is always gonna be 9.81 meters per second squared. However, the only time, this is the only acceleration that the object is experiencing is if it is in free fall, in which case we would say it's negative, all right? All right, that's the basics of free fall. We're gonna talk real quick about projectile motion. An object is considered to be in projectile motion when it is in free fall and it's moving in more than one direction, okay? So it isn't just moving up and down, it's not just moving side to side. A projectile is moving both up and down and or side to side. It has vertical movement and horizontal movement, all right? But it also is going to be in free fall, all right? So um, whenever we're looking at a project, uh, excuse me, a projectile, sometimes we'll call an object in projectile motion, sometimes we'll just call it a projectile. If you're looking at a projectile, you have to look at each direction separately, okay? You focus on all the motion in the y direction and you work all of that. And then separately, you, work at, you look at all of the motion in the x direction. You look at them separately. Occasionally, you might need to combine them. We could talk about that later. But as far as how you treat the motion, you're gonna start by looking at them separately, all right? So in the x direction, all right, if, you have a projectile, once again, projectile just means there's motion in more than one direction and it's in free fall, all right? So if you have projectile motion, there is no acceleration in the x direction. Whatever your velocity is to start with, it stays the same in the x direction, all right? This basic equation will be useful if you're looking at the x direction for projectile motion, okay? Y direction, since the object's in free fall, it experiences this acceleration, all right? First three equations on your equation sheet are going to be useful, all right? Um, time is a scalar. Velocity, displacement, acceleration, all of these are vectors, so you have to be careful about the direction. You have to treat them as separate direction. However, time is a scalar, so time can go back and forth. If I calculate the time in the x direction, I can use that in the y direction because time doesn't depend on direction. Time is gonna be one of the big things that helps you to connect the two. It's gonna help you to connect separate equations, all right? Um, there are three basic kinematic equations that we can analyze. Um, these three equations can only be used if you have uniformly accelerated motion. The acceleration has to be constant, all right? But you've got these three basic equations, these three basic equations, all right? And uh, yeah, okay, good. All right, so keep in mind, I mean, for example, right this one, this one uses an X, that's how it shows up in your equation sheet. These can be applied to any direction. So I can change this to Y final equals y initial. I can change this to a delta y. So I can apply these equations to either x or the y direction, and that's fine. All right, so how do you know which equation to use? Well, I'll tell you how I take the approach that I take. There are other people that take different approaches. Um, the first uh, 
YouTube video that College Board put out. It was for rotational kinematics. He actually starts by looking at a problem um, just with traditional linear kinematics. And he actually has a different approach to knowing what equation to use than I do. So I'd recommend you check that out. Maybe that resonates with you and, you, and it just makes sense to you, in which case go for it, that's fine. But this is how I usually begin, all right? I start by looking at what the problem wants me to do and what information does the problem give me. So I identify what is the problem asking. Okay, my equation probably needs to have whatever variable I'm trying to solve for, all right? Then what's the additional information that the problem gives me? And I list it out, all right? After I've done that, I start looking through my equations and I try to find an equation that has all the variables that are given to me and that I'm looking for, all right? And sometimes one equation doesn't have that, but if I take two equations, I can use both of them together to get the information that I need to, all right? So that's kind of the approach that I take, all right? So next four problems, I want you to practice. You don't have to actually solve them, you can if you want to, but I want you to just identify the equation that you would use Identify the equation that you would use to solve the problem. Okay, identify the equation that you would use to solve the problem. So, <clears throat> excuse me. First one a ball is thrown upward with an initial velocity of 20 meters per second. How long will it take the ball to reach its maximum? height. Okay. How long will it take the ball to reach its maximum height? So once again, the approach that I take, once again, the approach that I take, I try to identify what the problem is telling me, or excuse me, I try to identify, well, I do try to identify what the problem is telling me. I also uh, make sure that I can um, that I know what the problem is asking me to do. All right. So, um, okay. So do that. Take a look, pick which equations you think would be useful. All right. One thing I do want to point out is that there's not necessarily one right equation. This is the right equation. I have to use this equation, all right? Sometimes with the situation, I guess that could be fair. Maybe there is only one approach that works, but I like to look at the equations as tools, all right? Uh, and honestly, everything we talked about with those graphs, graphical analysis, those are tools. Use the tools that you know, that you're familiar with to solve the problem. Um, I can't remember the specifics who it was or anything, but at, when we were going over kinematics, I threw a problem at you guys and there were some students who decided to turn the problem into a motion time problem. And they created a motion time graph and used that to solve the problem. When I was originally thinking that they would use an equation, they didn't use an equation, they used a motion time graph and they got the right answer. I had never even thought about doing that, but it worked. And that's fine. If it gets you the right answer, it gets you the right answer, okay? So I'm not going to tell you which equations you need to use right now because there could be different approaches, all right? So second one, an airplane lands on a runway with a velocity of 150 meters per second. How far will it travel until it stops if the rate of acceleration is constant at negative three meters per second squared, okay? So identify what the problem is trying to get you to figure out and what information does the problem give you. Third problem. An object has an initial velocity of 15 meters per second. How long must it accelerate at a constant rate of three meters per second squared before its average velocity is equal to twice its initial velocity? All right, and a projectile, fourth problem, a projectile is launched horizontally with a velocity of 25 meters per second from the top of a 75 meter height. That doesn't make sense. Building, hill, whatever, okay? It's uh, 75 meters tall. How many seconds will the projectile take to reach the bottom? All right, now I'm pretty sure I don't have any notes here that give you an equation. So what I'll do is on my actual slides that I posted at some point today, this week, I'm not sure, it depends on when I have time. Um, I'll go ahead and post what equations I would use, but that's not necessarily meaning that's the only approach that can be taken, all right? but I'll go ahead and put those on my slides later on. 
All right, now let's attempt an actual problem. Um, so here's the problem. You've worked on a physics problem for hours, you're not getting anywhere, and you throw your textbook up in the air in a fit of rage. What will the velocity be when it reaches its maximum height? And what will the book's acceleration be when the book's velocity, uh, what will the book's velocity be after it falls from 1.5 meters from its maximum height? All right, I don't think I have any notes on this one either. Oh, I do, okay. Oops. Well, you got an answer right there. So um, one thing to keep in mind is that a lot of times we think that an object has to be moving down in order for it to be in free fall. Um, there's no qualifier for it having to be moving down. Um, it just has, the only force acting on it has to be gravity, all right? So in this situation, you throw the physics book up in the air once it leaves your hand, the only force, we're gonna neglect air resistance here, the only force acting on it would be gravity. So even though the object is moving up, it's still considered to be in free fall, all right? Once, let's tackle the first question. Once it reaches the maximum height, it's not moving, it's changing. Notice, actually, maybe we can go back. Let me pause this. Let's go all the way back here. So take a look. Notice right here, at some point we have a negative velocity and then it becomes zero and then it goes positive. In order for the velocity of an object to change from negative to positive or from positive to negative, it at one point has to cross the axis. It has to become zero for one moment in order for it to change from positive to negative or negative to positive. So if we go back to our problem, right here. What will the velocity of the book be when it reaches its maximum height? Well, when we first throw it, the book's traveling up. As it travels up, it has a positive velocity. That velocity is getting smaller and smaller. It's slowing down, all right? And then after it reaches its peak, it starts going down. As the object's moving down, it has a negative velocity. Well, in order to change from a neg positive velocity to a negative velocity, it has to be zero at one point. That happens at the maximum height, at the peak. All right, what will the book's acceleration be? Well, what's the only force acting on it? The force of gravity, which means there's only one acceleration. And that's gonna be the acceleration due to gravity. So it's gonna be negative 9.81 meters per second squared, okay? What will the book's velocity be after it falls from 1.5 meters per second from its maximum height, all right? So, excuse me. I know, let's identify what we know. I know my initial velocity, I'm gonna start at the peak, all right? I'm gonna start at its maximum height because that simplifies things. At its maximum height, I know what the velocity is. The initial velocity is zero meters per second if I start at the max, whoops, if I start at the maximum height. It's gonna fall five meters, 1.5 meters, okay? So I have a change in position, a change in position of ultimately, negative 1.5 meters because it's going down. The problem wants me to know a final velocity. It wants me to calculate the final velocity. I know what my acceleration is. My acceleration is gonna be negative 9.8 meters per second squared. I'm gonna round that to negative 10 meters per second squared, okay? So let's identify what the problem's asking us to figure out and what we know, okay? I know my initial velocity, because I'm starting at the maximum height, I know that my initial velocity is zero meters per second. And I know that my total change in position is negative 1.5 meters. I put negative because it starts higher up and then it goes down, down is negative. I know that my acceleration is gonna, I can use negative 10 meters per second per second. And what I'm trying to figure out is the final velocity. So look through the equations, see if you can find an equation that fits that and plug all of this information into that equation. All right, I'll bring up the notes again. You should get a final answer of approximately negative 5.5 meters per second. All right, your answer should be right around negative 5.5 meters per second. All right. All right. So, 
coming back to projectile motion, um, flipping physics does a pretty good walkthrough of a sample projectile motion problem. Um, this link, I mean, you can't click it on my video, but if you go to the actual slides that I've posted in Google Classroom, you can click on these links. Part one of the walkthrough, part two of the walkthrough, I highly recommend you go through it. It'll be very helpful. Um, so, there we go. Stop share. Look at that, I'm back. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that's the information that I have for you, uh, my slides for um, kinematics. Um, big points to hit on are those motion time graphs and being able to use the equations, all right? Now keep in mind, AP uh, College Board for AP Physics 1, they don't hit a lot on actual calculations. A lot of times they want to know that you understand the relationship between variables. If I double the acceleration, how will that affect the time that the object's in the air? If I, um, oh goodness, they, they just, I don't know, I'm trying to think of another example on the spot. It's not working very well in case you couldn't tell. But they, they want to know that you understand a lot of the qualitative stuff. You're not going to get a lot of problems that focus on give me an actual number. Um, it could be, here's a situation, derive an equation that would tell you um, what the time is uh, for how long it's in the air, all right? And keep in mind with deriving an equation, you're going to start with the basic equations that they provide you. You're going to start with those three basic kinematic equations or some basic definitions like acceleration is a change in, in velocity over time or velocity is a change in position over time. You're going to start with those basics. And then you're going to, you're going to um, use algebra to adjust those, manipulate them following all the rules for algebra so that the equation looks the way that you need to. You might even need to use multiple equations to get what you need, all right? Um, I can try to, if you want, I can try to do a video later on or maybe find some resources that will help us get better at deriving equations. Um, I didn't focus a lot on that this time because I wanted us to just go over the content. Um, but Hopefully that's helpful. Once again, look in AP Classroom. I uploaded a couple of practice problems, or uh, excuse me, I uh, uh, opened up some as uh, assignments in AP Classroom. Um, the uh, kinematics check, that's just multiple choice. Go through them, answer them, do your best, turn it in. Pretty sure I have it set up so that you'll get feedback right away, explanations to help you understand it. Um, Work those free response problems. See what you can come up with. If you work them and you want me to check it out, score it, give you feedback on it, I can, just let me know. It's fine. Not a big deal. Um, I'll try to keep an eye out for that. That way, if I see something like that, I can go ahead and do what I can to get that updated. Um, but go through those this week. Um, my plan is to do one of these at least once a week. I might upload them twice a week just to make sure we get through um, all of the different units that we need to so that we're ready for um, the AP tests when, as they come up, plus the tests that I will be administering to everybody who isn't taking the AP exam. So it'll be good. Uh, let me know if you have any questions. Um, I am also contemplating, I need to figure out how this will work out for me and my schedule. I'm contemplating maybe trying to at least at least a couple times a week, just have an open, uh, I'm using Zoom to record this video, an open Zoom session that students, if you want to, you could just log in. Uh, that way, if you have questions, hey, mister, I was working this practice problem, I got confused, can you help me out? That's fine. Um, I'm thinking about trying to get something like that going, I'll let you know um, uh, as far as when that is, what the code is, how to join it, all that stuff. I'll give you more details about that. But. Um, yeah, hopefully that helps. Um, hopefully some things clicked. Um, flipping physics is a good way. It's another resource to review. Um, I really like flipping physics in case you haven't figured that out. Um, Khan Academy is also going to be good. Um, and then uh, honestly, these college board videos that they're putting out, they haven't hit, uh, so far as I'm aware, they haven't hit regular kinematics yet, but I'm sure they will. So look for those. That's another resource. You want to expose yourself to as many different resources as possible because maybe the way I say something uh, doesn't make sense to you, but flipping physics, it made great sense. Or maybe the video that College Board uploads, maybe that makes a lot of sense to you. And, and that's fine. Like I'm, I, I, I'm not offended. 
if you get confused by what I say, what I care about is that we eventually help you understand what you need to understand. And if that's through a different source, uh, that's fine. That's fine. As long as we get you there. So anyhow, I hope you have a good rest of the day. Um, you can go through this video at whatever pace you'd like, maybe tackle part of it. Uh, make sure you understand motion time problems, uh, how that works, pause it, watch it again and again. Um, but, uh, yeah, there you go. Hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. Wonderful week. Let me know if y'all need anything. See ya.